Hey folks, thanks for joining us again this week for Houndsman XP. I hope all the hound dog, dog and moms out there had a great Mother's Day and got to spend it with your kids and doing the things that you all enjoy doing. So day late, happy belated Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. In this week's episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, we are going to South Texas. Shorty and I sit down with Bubba Allen. Uh, we were in the, on the ranch that he manages and just sat down outside on a beautiful day in South Texas and had a great conversation. Bubba uses his hounds to do, um, to do a lot of damage control work on hogs here in Texas. So there's a lot of good stories about catching South Texas hogs. We also talk about breeding and selection of dogs and, and just a great conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And it's always fun just to sit down and talk about dogs among houndsmen. So great conversation there. Before we get into the podcast, a couple things. Uh, it's been pretty slow legislatively. Maine had a little bit of a scare up there with a, um, a bill that, that would make hound hunting almost impossible in Maine, but uh, it was, it had to do with the company and hounds and things like that. I kind of dropped the ball on that last week. I should have included it in the pre-roll last week, but thankfully, you know, groups like Sportsman's Alliance and Hunter Nation, and uh, they stayed on top of it, and the hounds went on the ground in Maine. You know, Mark Dufresne called me and talked to me about this whole thing. He's been working on that up there as well so the houndsman in maine stepped up once again and defeated the this is a subversive type bill that uh, they were trying to restrict the use of hounds not not the not the actual hunting of the animal it's your typical tactic where we'll just make it harder for you to be able to do this well, good news. It was voted down this week. It is dead. It's not going anywhere. No thanks to us because we didn't bring any press to you on this at all. And my apologies to the main houndsman for uh, missing that one and not staying on top of that. But you guys were effective and congratulations to you. Make sure that you stay in tune though. There is no time to go to sleep at the switch on these issues, folks. It, with the with the legislative sessions winding down in these states, then now is the time to start building those relationships with your representatives, educating them, and and making them aware of of why we do what we do, and make sure that they know your name, and and that way you have some influence there. So now's the time to do that. Not next not next January. It's going to heat up again on social media, and we're going to see bills popping up and there's going to be this big alarm about uh, we need to act now well i'm saying now is the time to act not next january right now is the time to act start building those relationships now so you can do a couple things to do that one thing you can do is look at groups like sportsman's alliance and hunter nation make sure that you're joining those groups and making yourself known to the leadership of those groups and building your relationship there as well so that they know who you are and and you know who they are and and you understand what you can do for each other so so join one of those one or both of those organizations i mean we're talking less than a $100 bill to be able to stand up to preserve, protect and promote this lifestyle we live don't forget about your state organizations either Get involved there. A couple weeks ago, we ran a, a podcast about the Wisconsin Bear Hunters Association. That should have given everybody some hope of what is possible when we have good people that are willing to step up. And one person doesn't have to do everything. If all of us just did what we could do, we would be able to enjoy this lifestyle for a long, long time. We appreciate every one of you. It's time to get into this interview. We really love having you here and supporting us thank you for all your support this past week and here it is folks it's time to dump the box all right we are not in a wind tunnel we are out in it in south texas and uh i'm here with uh my friend shorty gorm on this one and uh he's co-hosting we got a special guest with us and uh, man it's a beautiful day out here 
It is. Hear the birds chirping in the background. I can't hear anything except you breathing in that mic. Or the wind blowing across your mic. That's I'm not just sure hot air you. coming out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Shorty, you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, we're here uh, Moore, Texas. That would be probably the closest town. Um, we're at a little place on a ranch called Fish Camp, but we're not fishing. We're here talking about... Uh, so this is called the Fish Camp Ranch? No, sir. This, this location. This location. Where we're at. We're, on the, we're at the fish camp on the ranch. Yes. I'm, I'm Hence get, I'm the lake trying, behind me. There is a nice big lake here. Yeah. Uh, and we're here with a friend of mine, Bubba Allen. And uh, Bubba, I won't tell your whole story, but Bubba's a, a quail hunter slash hog hunter. So obviously not running the same dog for both, which would be cool. Um, but uh, Bubba... Uh, why don't you, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into hound hunting and, and, uh, and whatnot and how you got into the dogs that you're hunting now. Yeah, I was in high school about 35 years ago. Uh, a fellow by the name of James Land, he was, uh, pretty much my mentor, mentor and my first, uh, as far as the hog hunter, hog hunting went, I had coon dogs when I was a little kid, grew up with coon dogs and and hounds and such forth but uh but james land he had a, he had a line of dogs uh at that time probably 30 so we're looking at 60 65 years of dog breeding and selective breeding uh probably sophomore in high school when i first started going with him and uh was a lot of fun a lot of adrenaline and uh, soon the coon dogs went away and went into the hog hunt and got a lot more serious about it I've only heard I've only been in South Texas for a couple of days and I've heard James Land's names multiple times. He uh if you have a dog hunt, in you know. South Texas that you hunt any kind of animal with, you will most likely know who who he who he was. He's a good fella and a good dog man. Uh kept a lot of dogs, called a lot of dogs, just a good dog man in general and and had a good as far as I know the best line of dogs uh in south texas describe those dogs uh he started uh he started with some some cur dogs out of florida uh the parting line of cur dogs and he bred some his his father uh was a wolf hunter and we call wolf hunters in south texas coyote had coyote dogs hounds uh running walkers uh he took his his daddy's old line of dogs and selectively bred them back into the the cur dog strain uh, added a little uh, long-legged pit bull for some tenacity, uh, but a very, very small, and diluted it greatly uh, for to to achieve the kind of dogs that he wanted. Uh, the bulldog in South Texas, we get in a we get in some bad situations and some bad thickets. And Shorty will tell you that's where the bobcats like to live, and that's where the hogs like to live. You get in a white brush thicket and you might be crawling in on your belly trying to see what the dogs are barking at and unfortunately the hogs can't climb a tree so they're on the ground and and you're on the ground on your belly and uh not able to move so right it takes a dog that has a little grit sounds like a hog hunter's got to have some tenacity you gotta have grit. a little all the while you're dodging rattlesnakes yeah and watching yeah. where your elbows and your hands are landing because there sure could be a rattlesnake there in that snake boots that aren't going to help you when you're crawling head first through that brush mm -mm. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, those dogs are just, just a little so that he could get, when he heard them barking, he wanted to know that they were visually looking at him and which dog he was listening to that he could walk, he could crawl in on his hands and knees and uh, make a good, clean, ethical shot uh, to dispatch the hog at the time. Did mm -hmm. not like uh, using straight catch dogs per se. Uh, that tends to get one hog at a time. So... Uh, he would take these dogs and bay up a pack of hogs, and the cur dog instinct is to circle and keep them herded like you would herd cows, uh, keep them at bay, but uh, just enough bite to keep them from sticking their head out too much and, and enough sense to, to handle, and handle is a big big part of this. Uh, but that little pinch of bulldog, just to, when, the, when it got tight in there in that thicket, just to keep him looking at him and keep him barging, barking and may take a lick or two but but keep on going where do you think the brains of those those hounds come from uh you know uh because you want you want a dog that's smart enough to to do the work you want him to do 
they you know they get it they got it from both sides i think uh that strain of the hounds that that i'm fairly not familiar with anymore it's, it was a little before my time uh you know but they were a different kind of hound than what is today not knocking the hounds of today by any means a little different kind of kind of hound uh looked a little different uh a little more bone a little more substance those hounds that i can remember seeing uh than our little tighter made kind of dogs today a little little maybe a little smaller uh maybe a little faster today than they were uh and i'll i'll go into that a little later about speed but uh but yeah they they got brains from the from the cur dog side and i think it was a good compliment mm-hmm. between the hound and the cur dog at the time uh so we talked before bubba about you know the dogs being smart how they're baying um uh and then you guys would actually walk inside of this bay and uh and take more than one animal one at at a time how how did that work typically that was the 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 best scenario what we tried to achieve with these dog was to get a rally what we call a rally that is where the the sows are protecting their their pigs and their the the half grown hogs and they Safety in number, same as the way the cows operate. The cows don't want to leave a baby calf. Mm-hmm. The hogs then, a little different today, the hogs then didn't want to leave their babies behind. They're used to coyotes catching them, and they just, safety in number. So when the dogs would bark at them, they would make a croaking noise and uh, rally up and pack up and make a bunch of racket and to intimidate coyotes. Well, these dogs were a little... I'm not going to say tougher than a coyote because I don't know there's anything tougher than a coyote, but <laughs> but they had a little more persistence and and they would stay with that, uh, keep barking and make those hogs make noise. And that was our that was our golden shot to two of us slipping there side by side. Uh, we had a plan. We never, you know, we tried to slip in there, watch the hogs for five ten minutes, get an idea who was in charge and who was making the calls and escape route and we would pick that hog off first uh, that was our first our first shot is who was in charge kind of like taking the general out of the army it was it was chaos after that the hogs would just pause and stand allow us to get four or five more shots out and dispatch it was nothing for us to kill seven eight ten hogs at one time yeah. right there in a matter of 15 seconds 20 you, seconds you mentioned coyotes you know a coyote coyote every wild animal but especially a wild predator you know it's all about risk and reward for them you know is the reward i'm going to get worth Worth the the risk risk. so you got a coyote there and he's thinking about taking on a mama pig mama Mm -hmm. hog you know big sow and and he's like "Mm, i'd like to have pork tonight but it's going to cost me a lot of energy to get that and a lot of risk involved Exactly, and so that shows what our concentration of breeding has done in our in our hounds and our cur dogs, you know, to bring out that instinct to catch, but have that tenacity to stay. Exactly, and those same dogs would, you know, eight or ten dogs on the ground bay that pack of hogs and not pressure them to make them run, stay off and bay them, and then the same dogs at the same time a 200 250 pound boar with three inch teeth run off and they would physically catch him and manhandle him Mm -hmm. the same type of dogs that's that's the brain behind these dogs is they knew that we're going to stand back and bay these because he's going to come and shoot them but then we're going to get to catch them after the fact whatever doesn't get a bullet's going to get us so So you're covey shooting the first group and then you're going out and picking up picking up singles after that i hear you that's the whole idea of this kind of way we hunt other than using a a catch dog or a bulldog where you lead them lead him up there turn him loose and you catch one Mm -hmm. and then the dogs go on and you catch one you know we're trying to get multiple kills at one time so that's basically uh there's a lot of sport hunters. I'm not saying it's the right way or it's the wrong way. There's a lot of sport hunters that aren't trying to <clears throat> do a service. They're going to catch one at a time, and that's that's how they, they don't want to shoot over their dogs. Maybe they don't take the gunshot real well. Some dogs do. Some dogs don't. These dogs actually – I just got back from well, – I just well, drove down here from uh, south Louisiana and we hog kind of the marshes up there for 
two days. And, and it was single catches, and it was, uh, you know, anchoring, anchoring the hog with a knife. Um, no, no shooting. Um, and bulldogs. So uh, I think it's interesting. You, you just move a few hours from a very strong hog hunting area to another really strong to see that difference. And that's what, what we try to do on the podcast is showcase how Bub Allen does it and how you people you've known do it in South Texas and how it can be different but effective. And you know the best thing about it, nobody does it the wrong way. That's it. It's all the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just because we're different doesn't mean somebody does something different doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, so in your in your we'll get into breeding. I want I really want to pick your pick your brain a little bit about breeding. But getting back to the whole hog hunting thing, um, were you doing depredation work? Were people calling you? Yes, uh, probably 85% was depredation work. Uh, landowners call, farmers call, have a problem. We'd show up, scout, look around, uh, do our homework, talk to the landowners, talk to neighbors. Uh, it was very important that we had everybody's consent, uh, that it was okay, the dogs, we could recover our dogs. Uh, Did you ever have hogs. any problems with that, with people that didn't want to let you? Yes, uh, there was there was problems at time. uh not early on. Early on, uh, mostly it was country people were country people, and they grew up with dogs, and they understood hounds and and cur dogs and hunting dogs, and and then times change, and we get doctors and lawyers, and again, I'm not saying anything bad about doctors and lawyers. Everybody needs them. They came to the to the country and started their, and this is why my dog breeding has changed. They come to the country and have a hunting ranch, and you know. They didn't understand the importance that the farmer, their neighbor, uh, had a problem and being the neighborly thing to do was to help your neighbor and to grant permission, this is how we're going to handle it. This was before helicopters and and things like that. Uh, what about the high fence? Was all this high fence in this no, country? No, uh, there was some, but not a lot. There so was how not long a lot. ago did they start the high fence deal? Uh, I would say we're going on probably 15 to 20 years okay. now, that, and some before. But now today, high fence is a is a typical normal, and I'll explain why my dogs have changed the way they have changed today is mm -hmm. what they were 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Where's the most interesting place you've been called to catch a hog? Uh, the golf course in a subdivision. That was pretty interesting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's a lot of money involved in a golf course. Uh, you know, farming and stuff like that. I'm not gonna say it's the best. The best was on the golf course, but uh, most a lot of people standing around watching. Uh, I've <laughs> caught hogs on people's porches, and they're looking out the window, giving me the thumbs up. You know, it was, uh, but it was all good back then. You know, it yeah. was, they they needed help, and we were there to help. What uh, what kind of dog food did you feed your dogs back then? Uh, back then they pretty much uh. They pretty much ate what they caught. Uh, we caught a lot of hogs. There was a lot of hogs to catch. Uh, sometimes it got cooked. Sometimes it didn't. Uh, sometimes we had a pile of wood that needed to be burned, and we burned the hide and made some cracklings and, and uh, pulled it off. Those dogs were smart, and they were glad to get what they got. And uh, Nobody growled. Nobody fussed. And 15 dogs may be eating off of one carcass. Uh, you know, cooked on some mesquite wood. That's that's some incentive for a dog to catch a hog. It is. No catch, no eat. That's right. So are you raising all these, these dogs together? you feeding them together? I think it helps with a, with a pack mentality. Uh, it's the brothers and their sisters and their first cousins and the line of dogs. Uh, you, you can do that when they're raised together like that in that atmosphere. You start buying dogs, and, and I don't buy dogs, but uh, – you don't have anything about somebody buying a dog. Uh, but you start bringing strange dogs to the house, and, uh, you know, he's a little growly, and he's a little worried. You know, somebody's smelling me wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm by myself now, and i got to act a little more airish. And, uh, you know, those other dogs don't appreciate that. Uh, right. A lot of times they'll, they'll get him off in the corner when nobody's looking, and, teach him a lesson that you're not supposed to be that way yeah canine psychology is a we need to find a canine psychologist for the podcast <laughs> uh, you know but a dog a dog when they the new dog that comes into the pack the pack's already established 
So that new dog's got to figure out where he stands. Where he stands, and and so you're going to have some of that. It's kind of like that. Remember that old Jerry Clower story about the the three bulls standing not, at the fence. I'm not that old. <laughs> You've seen Jerry Clower. <laughs> Three bulls standing at the fence, and a big semi-truck pulls in. A big gate drops down on the back. The new bull. The new bull steps out of there, and when he stepped out of the truck, the whole truck just kind of let off those springs. Just came up. It's a big bull. And and uh, the three bulls had the whole conversation. Before the bull got there, they were all talking. It's like, yeah, I hear the farmer's getting a new bull. When he gets here, you know, I'm going to show him what's what. I got 100 cows. I'm not giving him none of my cows. And it went on down to the young bull. He's like, well, I've only got, t- you know, one cow, and I'm sure not giving him my cow. <laughs> and and when the bull stepped off, the old cow, the old bull, he says, I don't know, boys. I, th- I think it'd be mighty unhospitable if we didn't share some of our cows with him. Second bull's like, yeah, I think you're right. I, c- I can afford to lose a few few bulls. And the late young bull, he just jumps a fence and runs out there and starts snorting and digging and pawing the ground and throwing a fit. And and the the old bull says, man, what are you doing? He looked over his shoulder. He goes, I just want to make sure he knows I'm a bull too. <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry Clower, he was a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I did him a huge disservice by the way I told that story. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty that. close. It was pretty close. Yeah. Uh. So, so, uh, hog hunting in South Texas. How many hogs do you still have down here? Oh, we have a tremendous amount of hogs. The hogs have changed uh, in the last 30 years. A great, I was going to ask you about that. A great deal. And I don't know if we killed the, we killed the ones that weren't smart. Uh, I contribute a lot to the high fences. Uh, and that's why my dogs have changed in the way of breeding, breeding now and uh, selective breeding for different, for same purposes, different. How's the hog changed? So you know, we have. Did high, you move from feral hog to Eurasian type influence or? Oh, uh, there's some ranches that have imported some. Uh, I don't agree. A lot of people say, well, they, they brought these European hogs in and they, I've got a ranch right down there. It's actually a hunt on and it's right down the road from Shorty's. They did the same thing. Those hogs are so bad. They'll run for a little ways, and then they just, they're going to fight you mm-hmm. almost every time. They're going to run three or 400 yards, and then they're just, bring it. I'm not scared of you. I'm I'm big. And they're big, and they're bad, and they got big teeth, and they're dangerous. And so I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the high fences, for one, now they're considered the, the hog. He walks out, even a brand-new high fence, those hogs walk that fence and they know, and they're even though it could be, you know, six or eight thousand acres, a, a, a pretty good size high fence. They walk that perimeter at a couple of nights in a row. They realize they they can't, for whatever reason, this is what I believe. They can't go through that fence. Another factor: they eat the protein. They get stronger. They get maybe a little bigger. Uh, South Texas, you know, 150, 75 pound hog back in the day was a pretty grown sometimes you would kill a 200 pounder uh today it's a little different they're a little bigger they're a little stronger but they got tennis shoes that they've grown on their feet uh contribute this to we caught the slower ones now the the more athletic ones the high fence of hmm. protein what's the fence nutrition. what do you think the fence plays into it i mean walking I just, the fence what do you think I, that's you know i just i go to places i hunt in a low fence uh atmosphere the hogs don't run too bad uh i don't know if that's because you run those hogs and they leave and some different ones come in that haven't been run before uh i don't know if that's the case i don't know if they just realize they can't get out they can't get away they feel trapped even though they're not in a, a trap, it's, you know, there may be four, five, six thousand acres. Uh, but they, man, I'm just telling you, they, it's, it's a different, it's more, a different atmosphere for them. They, more they're going to back and They're going to run yeah. and they're going to run dirty and they're going to run like a bobcat sometimes. And then sometimes they're going to run like a coyote. They're, they'll all be able to go in a white brush ticket about 15, 20 circles. And then they'll all pull out and go two miles across country. Uh, so we ran a hog in the marsh the other day that reminded me of, of a black bear. <laughs> the way seriously the way he that hog legged up and and i mean it he took him took those dogs for a ride it had one older dog on it that she stayed on it for several hours uh, probably two to three hours swam the swam the river 
with the hog and we finally got some dogs in but but as we were chasing that i was thinking dude runs like a black bear yeah for so 30 years ago if we ran a hog four or five hundred yards uh that was a pretty good race uh you know if he went a half a mile that was a pretty good race uh tonight if i took you hunting if i ran a hog for two and a half hours i wouldn't be surprised Mm -hmm. that's pretty normal uh you might say well maybe your dogs aren't as good as they used to be (laughs) could be i was thinking about that when i was telling you about the black bear race you're probably sitting there thinking that that hog didn't run like a bear you just need some better dogs (laughs) oh with the equipment and the sophistication that we have with the you know we went from no tracking collars to old beep beeps the old the old johnson collars and the wildlife boxes and packing them around on mules and horses and cutting through the country and hunting blackbrush wahia hills horseback uh to the day with the you know the dogs are different you, they they hunt a lot bigger uh i've bred them a little different again like i've said that i'm gonna speak of here in a second but uh you know don't have to cut across country to go find those hogs today uh put a little more hound into them and you know they're, they're covering more ground at one time let's let's talk about breeding a little bit because it sounds like your hogs have changed exactly and you needed a different dog the fences have changed and you need a little different dog the lands the people living on this landscape down here have changed and mixed it up a little bit so you need a different dog exactly so yes, wh- how, what'd you do what'd you do to address that so uh well mr land was still alive he had he had a, a really solid pack of wolf dogs that he caught wolves on the outside i'll say on the outside of the pen a lot of wolf hunters today they hunt in a in a pen because permission wise uh some people are not going to allow hounds to just roam all over the countryside running coyotes mm-hmm. uh, so they they've built pens in smaller places and they run coyotes in there uh he had dogs that he could go to to high fence deer pens uh three or four five thousand acre places had a coyote problem uh killing deer and and he'd catch coyotes and yeah. he'd catch them regular and uh dogs were solid uh fast a lot of endurance uh and pretty kind of rough kind of kind of hound you mm-hmm. know get to a coyote and two dogs catch a coyote uh by theirself uh so I've taken he uh he gave me a litter of puppies and uh and I took those puppies and he said, Look, you hunt these you take these these four puppies and uh you won't get out running those high fences anymore. And uh he was on his deathbed at that at that point. He told me, Take those puppies, he said, You'll quit getting out running these high fences and and my cur dogs is they were you know, they were running a hog an hour, hour and a half. Just they run hard and fast in the beginning and then they just it just starts to uh it starts to catch on them or this hog you know in the stick brush he and they say well how does a hog run that far that fast well they trot they run they trot they run uh speed is a a big important in my breeding is i feel that you have to push that animal to make him tired to make him stop and fight you uh because they're not going to stop and fight you unless you push them Mm -hmm. Uh, so speed uh which i'm i'm gaining maybe not the 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 100 yard speed but uh where i can see is my dogs that have more cur dog in them to my dogs that have more hound in them now at that about that hour hour and 15 20 minutes into the race that's when i see my hounds okay my cur dogs ran him hard and fast and they got him a little tired now i see my hounds on the gps everybody's got gps now so you can see who's doing what as far as the dogs and that's where I see. Are you talking about the same dogs? You're saying, saying I'm seeing my cur dog that I bred into this. Well, so. so Are you running curs some, and hounds? Well, that's what I'm crossing. Okay. That's what I'm crossing. So those cur dogs that have a lot of endurance, a lot of bottom, got some grit to them, I'm crossing them with my hounds. I've taken these dogs that, that he's long line of wolf dogs, and I've crossed them with the cur dogs. So about that hour into this race, I see the hounds. Now the hounds were a little behind. Maybe the hounds found it. The cur dogs got there. The have hounds have a little better nose. Uh, cur dogs have a good nose. They had some hound in them back in the day. And so about that hour long in the race, that's when I see the hounds starting to take over the. They're now instead of being 
number dog number four, five, and six. Now they're one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. And then I see them start to pull. That endurance uh, with the with the the hound is is a little greater at that point of the of the hunt. Uh, and I hunt every day. If I hunt every day, uh, I try to hunt three or four times a week. If I get to, if the job uh, presents itself, you know, the next day after a long night, those dogs that have more hound, they'll be up on top of the dog barrel bouncing ready to go the next day whereas the dogs that have more cur dog will be sleeping and taking it easy and those hounds are ready to go the next day hounds are a little more resilient you'd be a cur dog chris <laughs> <laughs> there was i wasn't always a cur dog i promise you that uh some of the there's there's a lot of people a lot more people hunting dogs dogs uh today than there was 30 years ago uh, very few people hunted dogs. Uh, you know, this guy hunted cat dogs, and that was pretty much all the cat hunters knew who he was. And this guy had wolf dogs, and all the wolf hunters today knew who that guy was. And the hog hunting the same, the same. But you know, there was, you know, there was a group of guys that hunted hogs, and a group of guys, you know, there was three or four of them. And now every town's got six or eight that got two dogs and a catch dog, and. A lot more people in the woods. So, I know, like, like uh, down here, um, if I'm, if I run a cat and don't catch him, uh, that cat is going to learn tricks, get smarter. Next time I run that cat, it's going to pull those, those tricks on the dogs. Uh, Robbie Hurt told me a long time ago. He said the summer times when we, when we spoil the cats, so they're a lot more fun to run in the winter. <laughs> um, do you, do you think these? these hogs um uh you you got some young kid that's you know just getting into it doesn't really doesn't really have the dogs that he's want wants and and maybe go run some hogs and doesn't catch them do you think that these hogs learn absolutely i think that is a another factor in it a lot more hunters uh different kind of dogs doing different things different hogs doing different things nowadays uh Maybe some of these, I know this is a problem, and some of these kids don't ask. They, they feel that it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. And so they sneak around, and then they cut their dogs off, and they quit hogs that, you know, that hog, you run him one time, and the next time you run him, he's going to be a lot different. And then the third time you run him, he's going to really be different. Uh, you know, so a lot of what I do now is, is maybe I get phone calls. I still do depredation and cleaning pastures but a lot of i get is hey i've got five hogs in my high fence and it's three thousand acres and i've had these guys hunting it and they they can't even find them and then they call me and so well basically i'm cleaning up a mess uh and those hogs are very educated they do not move very much they don't leave much scent because they don't travel uh they find us a, a source of water and a source of food and they stay put uh, usually far off of the road and you, you know if you don't have a dog that's going to get far off the road you're not going to find them you're going to pass them by because they're not going to cross the road they're not going to come out within and they're not going to ever come out in the daytime uh you know so majority is still a killing a vast number of hogs we have helicopters and stuff today uh but i come in and i clean up what they've already started uh and a lot of times that's a problem and that's again why i've changed uh my 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 races have like i said have gone from 30 minute race to two and a half three hours and i'm talking about that in the summertime uh you know we may run hogs a lot longer than that this time of year in winter time when it's a lot cooler uh we relay dogs uh we put dogs on hogs and and get them started and running and running and running and when i see those dogs kind of slowing down i just i fresh pack them I, i'll i'm not scared to go and dump dump two or three more into it and speed that hog up a little bit make him get tired make him go on and get bait uh there's a lot of people they don't have the numbers of dogs and <laughs> nor have any idea what i'm talking about uh when it comes to that uh but when i started i, I i'm i'm here to catch him and whatever it takes to catch him and if my, my dogs if if we quit him i'm gonna mark the spot and i'm gonna give them 30 minutes and well, we're gonna go get after him again i'm not i'm gonna I'm gonna work till I get him. So you take thirty minutes, go 
water those dogs, let them let them catch their air a little bit. And yeah, blow some air on them in the truck. It gets hot and still, and you know, physically, it just. I mean, they they do what they can, and then the environment just takes a toll on them. And I let them blow, and uh, then put them back. I'll, I'll put them back on the trail, send them down the trail, and they'll restart him, jump him, and and get it going again. Uh, with the straight cur dog, you're just you're not gonna be able to do that. Uh, that hog gonna trot. When you pick your dogs up, he's liable to trot another 45 minutes, 30 minutes. He might be trotting still when when you turn the dogs back out on him. Uh, and and that works sometimes. Uh, these dogs that I'm using, a lot of people are using them for deer dogs. Uh, they're multi-purpose uh, hound type dog. Uh, just uh, just hunt a little different. Uh, just hunt a little different. Is there is there an ideal number in your mind that you like to hunt if if things are going you know conditions are well uh whatever is there an optimum number of, of dogs that you like to run if i go to a new place uh with these kind of dogs i go to a new place and i don't think they're gonna run uh this this place right here that we're sitting on right now they're high fencing it uh it's a lot of hogs here if if i were to go on and just try to do a mass eradication i would probably start with about three dogs see how they handle but i would have another six in the truck mm -hmm. uh if they handle good and they bay up and they sit still then i'll go back to my old ways and i'll try to slip in there and and uh assess it and start shooting and uh and then after that i'm gonna go run to the truck or have one of my kids at the truck to swing the gate on whatever's left and uh but i'll always start with a few number uh i may haul 10 mm -hmm. And if I know I'm going to places not too bad, uh, there's not that many hogs, but I don't think they're going to. I may turn all 10 out. I may try to catch them, you know, physically handle them. Uh, if I think they might break and run a little bit, if the brush isn't too thick, uh, where a dog can really push one and, and run hard, some good open quail country type environment, uh, you know, I may turn them all loose and go to mugging on them. And uh, if it's real thick, you know, I may, again, where's the brush not thick i just moved those dogs over there <laughs> out of that sun and that shade and i'm i got i had cactus sticking in the back of my hand so so go back to my quail hunting a little bit we don't obviously quail hunt in this kind of terrain uh i've got a mulcher I, don't know how you could. I got a mulcher and a couple of bulldozers working right now that are cleaning and making mots in uh strip country and you know that changes the way the hogs run too. Mm -hmm. uh, these these dogs can run so fast in this brush, only so fast in this brush. But you open it up a little bit, let those hogs make about two laps. They're gonna make about two laps in the thicket. Try to get a little ahead of the dogs, and then they're gonna start squirting into these open countries because they know they got to make some time, and they know that the dogs are gonna gain on them in the in that open country. So mm -hmm. they'll they'll make a couple of circles, kind of like a bobcat. Mm -hmm. uh, make a couple of tight circles try to cross their track uh these 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 hogs today are smart you know they're they're gonna cut their track several times and uh you know that's that in itself you watch the gps you see the ones that that make all three circles and and pull out the other side and then you see that one making the fourth circle and you know whoop, well, we better we better hurry him up <laughs> better tone him or do something and say hey you missed the you missed the exit there buddy <laughs> it's time to catch up yeah so are your are your uh dogs while they're running a hog um or well let's go back to when you start the track um do your dogs open going down the track do they open when they're running a so i i uh with the technology i take my hounds or my half bloods or three quarter bloods or whatever it may be and i i I work with them with a collar and I get them started and I get them going and get them really hungry with a with the hog and then I tone them uh, I found that I can tone these dogs they know what that tone that tone means hey you're you might be messing up but you might not or maybe it means to do this those dogs that are those hounds are hard-headed and I like a hard-headed dog because I'm a I'm a little hard-headed myself and they take that tone and they start associating that tone is well maybe i'm not ex when they start opening on a on a cold track and they they hear the tone but the drive is there and so what they tend to do is shut up and let's see how far i can get away with whatever I'm, it is i'm doing wrong mm -hmm. and so they shut up and they go on and trail silent 
when they bay the hog and at that point that is because these hogs if they come out and started cold trailing on a bad spot those hogs are going to get out of their bed they're going to start trotting wherever they hear that dog it's just one bark that's all it takes after one bark uh my opinion secret low, low low fence excluded but in the high fence environment where the hogs are smart and they understand what's going on one bark the secret's out so at that point once they bay the once they bay the game they bay the hog uh i don't mess with them anymore they're right. wide open they bark as much as they want they keep the puppies pulled to them they keep they then they're working as a pack a pack of hounds and yeah if i see a puppy barking out of place same as cat hunting uh if he's if he takes all of a sudden he like we're talking about running that tight circle if i see everything pulling out and going across and and i see one hung up right there i'm gonna i'm gonna tone him out make him come to me and then put him but at that point, when I start toning him, he's going to pick up and listen, and he's going to hear them going on, and then he's going to go play catch up, and he's going to try to catch him, and uh, hopefully at that point they're going to outrun him anyways, and otherwise they're not running fast enough for me. So we get we got listeners that listen to this podcast from all over the world. You know, they've never hog hunted or never hunted here in South Texas. So um, some people would say that. I guess I, my my question in this thing is if you're running a silent trailer how do you keep your pack together how do they stay together well they have to learn to to smell the game that they're running they have to smell that hey this dog cut off right here uh why did he cut off and then he starts down where he smells that other dog and then he oh i smell it now here it is i just missed it right there when he cut that corner but when you're looking at your garment screen you 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 cut loose into this brush behind us here do your dogs spread out in that brush to try to get something going or do they stay pretty tight initially uh i've been with a lot of cat hunters uh you know they're covering a small area but they are covering it full blanket is what i would call it my dogs are going to travel they're going to you know i may have one three or four hundred yards to the left and i may have one five or six to the right once i get a feel that i've got them pretty broke and and broke as I mean exotics and and cats and coyotes and deer uh, because you can't go to one of these high dollar properties that has deer worth fifty thousand dollars and be bouncing a deer off of a off of a fence uh, so I get them good and broke and when I trust start to trust them then I start giving the bridle reins back to them and um, these these dogs that I have they'll start stretching and they'll start swinging and you know just like a swing dog and uh, you know he he's he's gonna not just stay in the road uh some of them are gonna travel the road they're gonna be scouring the grounds trying to smell a track uh my dogs don't associate like cat dogs that i've been with uh he's gonna go smell that bush he's gonna start wiggling and then 10 of them are gonna knock him out of the way so they can smell that bush they don't see it but but they will because they're not all together in the road at the same time Mm mm-hmm they see a dog over there and some hog sign or a waller and they're wiggling and whooping their tail and they're going to be like oh what has he got over there and they're going to go they're going to go check him that that part that instinct is there uh usually somebody's going to find the hog and everything's going to pull to them mm-hmm. uh, these hogs like I, I said a while ago they they're smart and when people mess with them a lot of times you know i'm i'm getting the sorry end of the deal and i'm coming in to clean up they've already killed all the easy ones and i've got three or four or five hogs left in five thousand acres and it's like finding a needle in a haystack and by letting my dogs range uh cover more ground then i'm i'm uh i'm discovering more ground you know well a lot of bear hunters you know they uh, overlaying this on that you know they don't want a silent trailer because then they can't feed feed dogs into where are you going to send a young dog if you're trying to teach them to pack uh, to the to the dog that's opening so i thought it was in, good to get an answer to that to see you know how you're doing it and and what your expectations were a lot of times i'll see my old dogs cut off and they may be trailing and, and i can tell they're now they're three or four of them together and they've all on the same trail and they're all in one little little group i'll take my young dogs and i'll start walking them down the trail staying on my track on the gps that the dogs yeah. followed until they start acknowledging and I, i'll watch them and they start wiggling their tail they start acknowledging uh first few times i'm going to take them i'm going to let the dogs go ahead and bay and open up and get in a race and then i'm going to send them out of the truck 
I don't like to do that too much because I feel that it takes a little hunt away from them. Uh, I'm going to get them going really good. Then I'm going to I'm going to probably set them up for failure and correct it. Mm-hmm. Uh, see a deer cross the road and go put them on the deer and and fix a problem while I have control of it. And I know what they're doing uh, other than going in the nighttime and not knowing watching the old dogs okay the old dogs are getting to the young dog or the old dogs taking the track or are they not taking the track oh the old dogs are not taking the track you know they're coming back okay now we have a problem we're doing something wrong and we correct it so so brings up a good point because you how much has gps changed the way you uh, want t- tremendous i mean that's why when i said a while ago laughingly well we didn't have a good of dogs today as we did back then well, I, I totally disagree <laughs> because we didn't know a lot of times what they were doing. Uh, you know, they just, they'd be gone for a little while and you didn't see them. And well, you turn the truck off and you just kind of sit there and, well, hopefully you heard them bark or you drove to the next hill and hopefully you heard them bark. And which same as, you know, cat hunters or wolf hunters did, right. uh, especially with the silent dogs. Uh, but you know that the gps it tells you who's doing what you know before well this dog you got to recognize in his voice and and so forth and so on but you really didn't know who was faster than who and who was really doing the work well, and then this one got lucky and he bayed the hog at the end you know because he cut a cross going to him and then he stumbled upon him and bait him you i know? spent 20 years thinking i had some pretty good dogs until i got that first Garmin GPS. Astro, and then I <laughs> yeah. then I didn't have any excuses. I could see it, and I was like, "Wow, you know, it was amazing, amazing." Oh, it, it it tells tells it it tells you exactly what everybody's doing. Yes. Only time it doesn't <laughs> when you put the wrong color on the wrong dog, and then you, <laughs> and you say, "Man, oh so and so ain't doing as good tonight." Yeah, <laughs> well, that's your fault. You put the wrong color. And you didn't know who he was. But, you absolutely can though. I mean, I do it with with coon hounds. I I had a I can know the dogs well enough you get a dog that doesn't open right away maybe they'll cold trail silent for a little bit and uh, you can tell yeah. when you're watching yeah. you know when they're moving around then all of a sudden it just slows down and in your situation and like bear hunting or whatever when the everything's out here and it's moving then all of a sudden it just narrows down and everybody's looks like one dog moving across there then you know they're on something well and you can watch the speed on them how okay they're just doinking along doinking along well they're going a little faster they're pulling they're pulling they're pulling now another one's with them they're pulling they're pulling something's fixing to happen turn that's the right. truck off and something's fixing to jump or bay or it's the same it, it gives you a lot of insight yeah so is this a is this a nighttime activity or daytime activity when do you prefer to hunt summertime you got to hunt at night early morning uh, that's the only shot you got in south texas by you know, most days nine o'clock in the morning. It's it's really by then it's it's too hot. Uh, so, you know, when summertime gets here, a lot of people put their dogs up and they don't hunt them. I'll, I'm gonna go on and go, uh, but I'm gonna wait till midnight, one o'clock. Little little dew fall. It still might be 80 degrees. Uh, might be might be hotter. I'll pick my days. I'll watch the weather. Uh, watch my barometrics, and you know, when everything drops and gets right, then that's well, I try to take advantage of it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and hunt from 1 or 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning. This time of year, a lot more effective. You're going, you're going to do a lot better. It's just, I mean, it's, what, 70 degrees right now, and it's in the middle of the afternoon and bluebird sky. It's kind of uh, cold. Yeah, kind of <laughs> cold in the shade right here. 70 so, degrees in South Texas is pretty chilly. Yeah. How do, how do hogs, do they act different at night than they do during the day when you're hunting them? Yes. Uh, so if I was going to hunt like right now, uh, you know, I'm not going to be in a hurry to get to them at daylight. I'm going to let them go get in their bed, and then I'm going to trail them because I have a different kind of dog now. I can trail them a lot farther. Uh, a hog in his bed is going to usually stay in his bed mm-hmm. unless he's in just a really one of those rotten bad but you might take that same hog, run him two and a half hours at night. You may wait till eight o'clock this time of year, and then kick your dogs out and let them trail him into his bed, and he might not run at all. He might stay right there. Daytime is always a lot better. Dogs can see. Dogs can run faster. They don't have to rely on their nose as good. They can kind of see where they're going, not run straight into a cactus, and then I'm pulling cactus out of their eyes and 
got their eye pin shut or you know they come to me and they can't open their eye and then look and there's big cactus thorn got their got their eyelid pinned to the bottom one you know and, uh you know it's it's better in the daytime yeah, yeah. by far yes yeah sir. yeah other than the hogs don't walk in the daytime but right. you got to have a dog that can go on and take a track that might be pretty old to hunt them in the daytime because they're going to walk all night they're not going to walk that much in the daytime so how would you describe uh, how old is how old of a track is too old for for one of your dogs to run down here it's it's i'm going to say it's solely going to depend on uh the weather and hot and humidity and if we got a little better and it's got a little more moisture in the air we can short enough take a lot older track uh summertime hot dry you know you better get a pretty fresh track or you're gonna have trouble yeah this ground out here uh it just eats the moisture up and the scent just goes it just goes away uh but you know as far as how long i've seen hogs in the daytime at at a, at a corn feeder deer hunting and i've gone back and got my dogs and come back like three and a half four hours later in the winter time and they've trailed that hog man they may have went mile and a half and trailed him up and bait him right but and and i don't know they trailed the right one or the same one but they left that feeder and they left in the direction the hog left when i saw him leave mm -hmm. uh and gone to bait that hog you know three and a half hours later uh i don't know that you could do that hot dry summertime no. in south texas no uh, a lot of them i got a lot of friends in east texas and and you know they'll come down and they'll well he's smelling that track that was probably a day and a half ago and and i just kind of laugh you know they're walking around in water over there and you know maybe not standing water but what he is the ground is still a little squishy and you're not going to see that here right probably ever you know yeah. even if it rains two inches you so, know every place every place has its own challenges we've we've talked about that and talked about it and talked about it but you know it, you just don't understand the challenges that you have here until you come down here and you see it and everybody is always talking about why well, you know i hunt in the toughest place on earth well you go someplace else and then you try to walk across that marsh and every other step you're sinking up to your waist and dogs are and then you go to the rocky mountains and it's you know inclines and declines and and trying to get through snow and so every place has its own challenges except indiana it's like lollipops and rainbows up yeah there. we just walk out there and turn the dogs loose and gather up stuff with butterfly nets <laughs> it's great yes sir do uh, you see uh and I have my own answer for my cat dogs, but do you see when you, maybe you don't leave this country, but if you took your dog somewhere else, do you see your dog struggle or do you see any trouble at all? What what do you see when you take your dogs out of this environment? Well, uh, I don't go that far. I go to East Texas, not far East Texas. I hope I've got some good friends there. I've gone up and hunted around uh, some of the Haythorn, Haythorn Sixes kind of country. Uh, dogs did really good there. Uh, for those for those that don't know, those are ranches, Haythorn Ranch and, and mm -hmm. Four Sixes Ranches. So it's a uh, more okay. north central Texas. Uh, some people call it West Texas. It's not really West Texas to me, but it's kind of running mesquite and, and a little bit of cactus. Nothing like it is in South. And I've got a friend up there, and I invited him to come down here all the time, and he he declines every time. He said <laughs> I've been down there one time, yeah. and there's absolutely no reason for me to come hunting that stuff. So, <laughs> but I enjoy going up there. My dogs. It's the same type uh, weather with less brush. Right. Uh, I would. I would say uh, as many hogs of uh, lots of hogs and they're not a lot of hog hunters and the hogs don't run mm -hmm. as bad so it's always a good I man I like to go up there because it's a you know we can go stack them we can go stack them in a and I just heard all the hog rigs fire up, and they are headed that way. Right? Headed that way. <laughs> 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 and been. all the people up there are like, dang you, Bubba, <laughs> telling our secrets. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the thing, that, thing about Texas, though, I mean – if you if you don't have there ain't any public land here right so no. you can talk about where you hunt cause yeah you can go up yep. there but unless you got a unless you got an end it's not good texas is a bad place if you don't have an end you're gonna burn a lot of gas driving around trying to find a place to hunt yes sir yes sir uh, i've hauled the dogs to east texas uh 
those river bottoms, briars, a uh, little different there. That's something that they're not used to seeing. Uh, but a couple of days, and they'll kind of they'll kind of line it out. Uh, those guys come down here, and they want to come down here. We have a lot of hogs, and they like to come down here, and then they usually come down here, and they won't come back anymore. They're like, oh, man, they can't run a hog down there. There's too many cactus, and then just, well, those dogs need to grow up down here. It <laughs> makes it a little different. Yeah. Put your big boy pants on and come to South Texas. But I do invite them. I'm, 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 I want to see it. I want them to come. But they don't like to come down here. Yeah. yeah. Yesterday, Chris asked me, he said, uh, he said, do you ever uh, do you ever get used to all this thing poking you all the time when you walk through this? I said, well, you don't have to like it, but you got to get used to it. You get used to it. Yeah. 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 It's a different world. It really is. It's uh, It's unique. And I like it down here, but it's different. And a lot of game down here. Yes, lots, a lot of game. Yeah, most of these rent, you know, it's this environment down here uh, is not it. It was cattle country. It always has been cattle country, but it's less and less cattle country. And and uh, a lot of these ranches, that's how they make their living is game. So they mm -hmm. make sure there's a lot of game. I remember we were catching deer with a helicopter one day and this young kid asked his grandpa he said why do we spend all this money on these damn deer his grandpa said son these damn deer saved a lot of sorry ass ranches yeah <laughs> they fed a lot of cows mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right hey, you've, you've probably you've getting single hunt i know you've caught thousands of hogs but if you got a single hunt that's memorable to you Sp I, something that's pretty special that's shared caught a shared story with us i caught a, a boar hog in george west that a guy called me for about three or four months it was during quail season and and again i don't want to i don't want to sound like i'm bragging or or anything but this you asked me on memorial this this was pretty special to me he had had 12 hunters uh, there throughout the last couple of years. This is a part of the podcast where you can tell a story that nobody will believe. <laughs> they, uh, they, they had he had had twelve documented. He was he had a bounty on this hog, uh, and and he asked me, got my phone number. He calls and tells me about it, and I'm I'm pretty tied up. But that's what's what I look for. I look for the one that the hard one. I, I want to. This is one thing to go to an easy place, and it's a lot of fun, and and. You sure get a lot of good work on a young dog, but I like the ones that are challenged. And uh, he said it's a challenge, and it's bad brush, and it's you know I've had these guys, and it's, it's, this hog has killed their dogs, and then they've not found him, and they've he's outrun them, and he's just and he and we got pictures of him. We know he's here because I asked the question, well, do you have pictures of him recently? He got holes in fences. He maybe he got out. No, we we, he, we he's here. One hog on three thousand acres. I went down, <clears throat> I took my dogs with me. I scouted around and uh I run the dogs a little while, didn't find him and uh got a little discouraged. Uh but that was that was one trip and I said, Look, I'll be back in two days. Uh I will find this hog. I will I will I will find him eventually, but I will come until I do find him. I may not find him the next time, but I'll 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 get him. Yeah. And uh the next time I I went and well I had I got lucky and then about about an hour i had him i had him up and going uh and he made a mistake and he come across he he came out of a really good thicket that he should have stayed in he made him about two laps and i think he thought he had enough head start and uh he told me he does this every time and he comes out of the tail of this tank and then he goes in and he goes into this thicket and then he makes him a couple of circles and then well he came out he made two circles and that white brush thicket to the tail of that tank, and he came out across, and they and they bait him in the tank. Uh, he didn't he didn't have enough he didn't have enough lead time. He should have made him three or four circles, and uh, he didn't he didn't, and it it was his mistake. And he got in the tank, and they and I got him in the tank, and the man was with me, and he was ecstatic. And uh, it cost me a dog, uh, but uh, a good dog. He cost me a dog. Uh, that's this. That's sometimes. That's why you you keep raising and breeding. Uh, and but as far as that was, that was pretty special to me because yeah. a lot of people had tried him and and not got him. They'd found him and they'd run him and then some not found, couldn't find him. Uh, 
you know, a place that big, he's, it's not an easy chore to find him. The second night I got lucky and I found him pretty, you know, an hour, I, I found him. He just, he made a bad mistake. Maybe he didn't think they were on him as, as tight as they were, but when he took the opening, he, he took it at the wrong time and uh, made a mistake and it cost him and I got him. So maybe it was lost my college ring in the lake at the time. Oh, man. Uh. <laughs> he made a mistake, but he, he may have he may have done that exact same thing to some maybe some other dogs that were maybe a little mouthier. He knew exactly where they were at or maybe the speed. What do you think it was? I, that, I think it was speed. That, I, speed. I think it. I think when he made the second the second circle in that thicket, I think he had a little – he thought he – because he was used to having that much ground and he had enough time to get to that other thicket, mm-hmm. hit that water one time and get a little wet and go on and get to that other thicket. And when he did hit the water, they were they hit the water with him. And he didn't have enough time to get across it. Well, once they had him there, they were spinning him and, and then they had him swimming and he, he didn't have enough time. They swim as fast as he could. And yeah. He didn't have enough time to get to the other side and, and go on. Sure didn't have enough time when that 44 got there. <laughs> <laughs> so, last question before we wrap this up. Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of people, we get, we get, we pigeonhole ourselves as a hunting community. You know, you got deer hunters, you got duck hunters, you got hawk, yeah, you got houndsmen. But even within the hound hunting community, we, we pigeonhole ourselves at times. You know, he, oh, he's a hog hunter. Oh, he's a coyote hunter. He's a coon hunter whatever it is but in my experience we've done we're closing in on a hundred hundred podcasts i've been in hounds for 40 years almost 40 now you know it seems like that that hog hunters there's a lot of misnomers out there you know i've heard that it doesn't take a lot of it doesn't take much dog to catch a deer and then the next on that it would be it doesn't take much of a dog to catch a hog. What would you say to that? Well, I'd just say that uh, they hadn't hunted enough. They just hadn't hunted enough. Uh, some deer are easy to catch, wounded deer. Some hogs are easy to catch. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, I pulled up to a feeder yesterday here at this place. Uh, like I said, this place hadn't been hunted in over 14 years. Probably never seen a dog before. And I pulled up there in my truck, and two hogs ran to my truck. Well... Those probably not going to be very hard to catch. <laughs> Some ones that you don't see ever. <laughs> you see where they've been, but you never see them. Those right. are a little different. So I'd say if, if somebody told me that, that uh, they just hadn't been in the woods enough and hadn't seen enough. Uh, they've uh, been out there on the easy days. They've been on the easy day. They've, they've had a good day. They yeah. hadn't seen the hard day. Right. And I think that's true. It's just, you you know, we all, it's just our nature that, uh, you know, I cat hunt. I'm, I'm a lion hunter. I'm a bear hunter, you know, and I'm, I'm just like everybody else, you know, put a hard running bear out there and, and you feel like you're really doing something, you know, mm-hmm. and there isn't anything else that can do this, you know, Man, so you, you gotta, let that ego creep in. You gotta, you gotta go out there and catch the easy ones, but you gotta catch the hard ones too. That's what if makes you, your pack better. If, if you can't catch the hard ones, then... Well, I don't feel any pride in catching the easy ones at that point. Right. I have. Well, I enjoy it because it's not always easy anymore, like it used to be. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like you progress through it. Uh, you know, when you first start, you just want to catch stuff. You just want to stack them up. You want to do body counts. You want to do. But now you've progressed into that breeder trainer. I'm sure that pulling the trigger on a hog doesn't mean a whole lot to you anymore. No. Uh, it's more about. And we find that is the common thread among houndsmen is it's it's never about, very seldom is it about taking the animal or harvesting the animal. Do we? Yeah. Are we ashamed of it? No. But as we progress, we find that that's not the most important part of why, why we do what we do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of pride in taking a an animal and special making it into a specialty animal just mm-hmm. like he's done with his dogs you know and and being able to to you know years ago you might not be able been able to catch that hog that you that you caught but you've done so much work 
throughout your years of hounds and, and the research and what do I need to, to catch a better dog and my, made the right combination. And to me, that's where the pride comes in catching that hard one is, is man, look what I, look what I've got to accomplish with this, with this set of dogs. Yeah. That's yeah. that trigger doesn't mean a dang thing. Yeah. They've got a piece of you in them now. They've got yeah. your emotional attachment and, and that's why it's hard when you lose a good one, but well, I know that if I lose a hound, I'd rather lose them doing what they're bred to do mm -hmm. than, you know, dying of kidney failure or cancer or something. So, I, so I'll, I'll put it this way. I can I can go to a ranch and catch a hog that maybe he, maybe he just, the dogs trailed off and they bait him and walk in there and he's got five inch teeth and weighs 300 pounds. Which is a trophy hog in South Texas by anybody's standard, and then I can go take a seventy-five pounder and run that booger for three hours, and I got more pride in that mm -hmm. than I do that big trophy. I'll talk. Yeah. I'll talk more about it. Uh, I'll talk more about it that three-hour race than trailing him up, baying him in his bed, and walking in there and killing him. Well, it's I mean, like it's like treating a uh, fall bear. Yep. You know, fall bear, you get a big anything over 200 pounds or fat or sloppy man you get a 90 pound 100 pound bear in the summertime or in the spring when they're just coming out of their den they're lean and they are runners so they can hook it and hook yes, it yes they can yes they can yes sir you got any final thoughts shorty anything we missed no i just just glad we get to you know let everybody hear about a little different style of south texas hog hunting just you know, you know, it doesn't matter where we go or who we talk to or what game they're chasing. That common thread is always there. That that dedication to hounds and and uh, you know the amount of of pride that goes into you know the way the way houndsmen have the way they feel about their their hounds and the way they take care of them and and the work that they put into them and it's just common thread wherever we go. A dedication, you know, I. It's we call it a lifestyle because you got you got to be a little bit crazy to do this, you know. Uh, you know, it, it, these are a 365 day a year, every day job to keep them honed up and to care for them, and and I mean there aren't any days off for a houndsman. If you're not dedicated, you just own dogs. Yep, yep. You got any final thoughts, Bubba? No, sir, but it's just been a pleasure, and it's been fun hanging out with fellow people and, and houndsmen and dog people, and it's been a great day today. Until next time, you follow your hounds, I'll follow mine. <laughs>